Well, I'd like to greet each and every one of you out there in, in cyberspace, <laughs> actually in your living room or wherever you're at. We're glad you've joined us today. We've gathered here. We're worshiping together. We've had some great songs, and the presence of the Lord is among us. And we're glad that you've joined us today, and we ask the Lord's blessing on you. Uh, this morning, we're going to make a proclamation, but I just want you to ponder upon the idea of uh, a weak prophet, a butane or a praying torch, and no excuses. Wimpy prophet, a butane bush, and no excuses. We're in Exodus, by the way. I'll read some from Exodus chapter 2 and chapter 3. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the word of the Lord. Today I'll be taught the word of the Lord. Boldly I confess. Boldly I confess. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same. And I'll never be the same. I'm about to receive, I'm about to receive the, incorruptible, the incorruptible, the indestructible, the indescribable, the, indescribable, the, indescribable, the ever living seed of the word of the Lord. And I'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. Amen. Amen. I, I did a series on the worst situation ever. And uh, I finished those. Last week was my last, my third message in that series. This morning, I want, I want to stay in the Old Testament yet one more week. And I want you to consider a man whose life was radically transformed because his mother was brave and wouldn't allow him to be killed. Back in that day, they were killing all the boy babies so they wouldn't keep building the population. And, and I'm reminded in, in chapter 2, Moses, Moses was born in chapter 2. It, it, we're told about a man in the house of Levi went up and took as wife a daughter of Levi. And so the woman conceived and bore a son. When she saw he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. Well, the story... She made a little basket covered with pitch and floated him out there where Pharaoh's daughter would bathe. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. Hey, there were crocodilian out there. There's crocodiles out there, you know. Oh. And Miriam, the sister, stayed with the baby or close by. And Pharaoh's daughter found this child and wanted to keep him for her own. Oh. What a story. But she didn't have anyone that could nurse him or take care of him. Miriam said, hey, I got a mom that could do that. And so Moses is sent back to his home until he's old enough to be weaned. Is, you see the story how God put this thing together? Uh -huh. Amen. Moses' name means to be called out. And so we find this story. So it's so powerful to me because God had a plan for Moses. Moses had no clue for a long time. But somewhere along the way, as he grows up, he knows that he is adopted. He's got to know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as he grows up, and as he watches the abuse of his people, even though he's of Pharaoh's court, he took on himself to do something about it. And as a soldier beat one of them, he killed the soldier and buried him in the sand. And then they, the Jews, who should have said, thank you very much. What are you going to do? Do that to us too? And so Moses flees. So Mo I want you to get this picture because now God's going to call Moses to do something interesting. Moses is a, <clears throat> he's a fugitive. You ever remember the movie called The Fugitive? Uh, he's a fugitive. He's on the run. He's hiding. Yeah. And, and so we find Moses, and I just thought this was interesting, chapter 16. It's very important that you hear this. The priest of Midian has seven daughters. So Moses ends up somewhere near a priest of Midian. And they came and drew water, and they filled troughs of water for their father's flock. When the shepherds came and drove them away, Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. When they came to Reuel, their father, he said, How is it that you have come so soon today? 
And they said an Egyptian delivered, listen to it, did you hear that? An Egyptian, Moses, who's a Jew, Hebrew, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he drew enough water for us and watered the flock. So he said to his daughters, and where is he? And why is it that you've left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. <laughs> you, you see the picture getting woven here? Moses was content to live with the man, and he gave Zephorah his daughter to Moses, and she bore a son, him a son, and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have seen a stranger in a foreign land. And now it happened in the process of the time of the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel groaned because of the out of the bondage, and they cried out to their and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. Now listen. Verse twenty-four. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Now, I need to do that before I got into the part I wanted to get into the part, because you need to have the background and know that when he came in that land, even though he was a Hebrew, he was an Egyptian, trained Egyptian, dressed like an Egyptian hiding, and shows up and delivers this man's daughters. That's a pretty cool story, don't you think? Yeah. And when they talked about him, they said, this Egyptian. <laughs> I don't know if he explained to them who he really was. Really irrelevant, because he became a part of that family. And one of this Levi's daughters married Moses, and Moses started a family. We don't hear much about his family after that, do we? So the Bible says Moses, in, in chapter 3, verse 1, was tending the flock of Jericho, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him on a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And so he looked and beheld the bush was burning. <laughs> burning with fire. But the bush was not consumed. <clears throat> Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. And then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for this place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look upon God. You like that story? Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up of the from the, that land to a good land, a large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, and to a place the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Pezzarites and the Hivites and the Jesuits. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with the Egyptians oppress them. Verse 10, Come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? You know what God's answer is? Verse 12. So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this should be a sign to you that I have sent you when you have brought the people of Egypt out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. Don't you like that? Amen. Well, there's a lot more conversation there, but it's interesting. And, and as you look at this passage of scripture, it's a familiar one. And it's a story that if you've been in church anytime, you've heard it and you've heard it told to you in Sunday school class. Amen. I love this story. The second, this Exodus, the second chapter in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus. And, and so it's at the very beginning of the line. Don't you like that? And, uh, and I was thinking, you know, hopefully 
And I, what, what I like here is we all, everybody has a Bible, or now we have the cell phone. <laughs> Not now, it's been here for a long time. Take your cell phone, and you have a Bible app in there. And there are a lot of great Bible apps where you can have daily scripture as well as. And so if you're on your phone and you're not a teenager, um, I'm thinking it's a scripture. <laughs> Hopefully you adults aren't playing games uh, during church. No, anyway. But I, I, I thought, you know, so, so, so God, is, God is, is watching this thing. God has heard the cries of the people. They're in captivity. They are suffering. And they're crying out to God, help us. And no one's helping. And Moses, who was on the run, he's been on the lamb for a long time. The king dies, which might take a little off of Moses, because that, that's the guy who wanted him dead, probably. But the king dies, and Moses is still bebopping out there, and he now he's met a wife, and he's got a, he's, he's working for his father-in-law, and he's taking care of a flock, and he's out in the middle of the desert. It does not say if he had workers with him. All it says is one day as he's bebopping along. Now understand this. Burning bushes are not unusual in the desert. The, uh, the, these bushes would, would die and, and the sunlight would hit them and the, and the reflection between the sand and the heat and they would combust. And it would burn and there would be nothing left. Isn't that cool? Wow. But this day as Moses is bebopping along. <laughs> God wants to get Moses' attention. They're on the, the mountain of God, Mount Horeb. And, uh, and, and as Moses is bebopping along, all of a sudden, poof, this bush, probably a pretty good sized bush, catches on fire. Moses had seen it a multitude of times. That didn't shock him. But as he's kind of bebopping around and he kind of looks over there a time or two, all of a sudden he realizes this thing is not getting consumed. There's a fire going on, but nothing is going away. Generally, fire consumes. And all you've got left is ash. And so Moses says, whoa, I am freaked out. I don't know what he said, actually, but that fits, doesn't it? Woo! For the Bible says that he went from surprise, whoa, look at that, to curiosity. What is that? i got to check this out. Now, most of you are, are, are curious enough that if you saw a bush burning, how about your dresser? Suddenly you're walking into the bedroom and your dresser goes, boof. And it's not getting burned up, and and the the, the finish the finish is not blistered up, and there's not smoke coming off of the thing, you know. And he goes, "I got to check this out." Now it could be a butane bush. It was a big bush. I don't know. And so he walks over to check it out. I got to check this out. Moses, I'm gonna go over and see why this bush doesn't burn up. And he walks over to it, and the closer it gets, all of a sudden. The voice of God. Now, Charlton Heston and several other guys had the voice. Um, Lloyd Ogilvie had the voice of God, too. He was, he was a great preacher, and he had this deep, you know. I don't know if God said in a deep voice, Moses, take your shoes off, your sandals off. I don't know if he said that or if he just said, Moses, take your sandals off. I don't know. But what I know is that when Moses walked into the presence of the Most High God, and God said, take your sandals off, you're on holy ground, it drew a response from him. The Lord spoke to him from a bush. Have, have, has anyone ever had God speak to you from a wood fire? You're out camping. you got food cooking. And there's logs flaming. Ever had a voice speak out of that? How about you were cooking and you used gas in your house? And you're doing beans. And... That's a good, isn't that good? That's a good subject. Or it could have been chicken and dumplings, too. I'm just thinking, either way. But you're cooking, and that flame is under there, and all of a sudden it goes boof, and God's voice says, hello. Most of us have never had that. How about a barbecue grill? Some of you who barbecue. You're out there, you're getting ready to throw those steaks on, or hamburgers on, or, or brats on, or maybe you got some chicken and you want to do it, and, and you're getting ready to flip it in there, you know, and boof. And God says, hello. I'll never forget, um, I used to deep fry chickens. You know, you have that big pot of hot oil, mm -hmm. and you very carefully drop that turkey in there, not chicken turkey. Um, I dropped the turkey in. Oh, it was, it was awesome. Came out. It was so beautiful. And, and little Tiff, her grandma was over at our house. And, uh, and I said, would you, 
I said, would you like me to do one for you? Because, I mean, I was having great success. And so a day or so later, uh, uh, I made another one for her. And, I, and, it, and it was frigid outside. I mean, it was so bad, below zero kind of frigid. And I, I, that thing was, it was a showpiece, most beautiful bird I had done. And we had it on the platter, and I took it over to her. She called later, and she said, I don't know uh, what happened to that bird, but she said, it just kind of fell apart. They, it, it, the, because of the crazy temperature, evidently, it, although it was beautiful, I should have sent it to some store and said, here, use this for a, a masterpiece, because it was petrified. It just kind of disintegrated. But I thought, you know, so that, so if you've ever seen a fire from one of those things, those cookers, if you spill it down into the flame, you got a serious fire. And I'm thinking, so I'm I'm doing getting ready to drop a turkey in, and it goes boof, you know, and you go, this is the Lord. Got some things I want to talk to you about, Mike. I I don't know, but I, I've never had that. I've had God speak to me, but ne not that way. Uh, but so Moses got Moses got 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 the attention. And I thought, I, I wonder sometimes, and I don't know, maybe, maybe Moses needs something so out of the ordinary to catch his attention, maybe because he was so preoccupied with his life, his family, and his past, mm -hmm. that he couldn't hear God in conversation. And so God did something spectacular to get his, his, his focus. And, and I thought, you know, if you're in the wilderness by yourself, there's no one around you, there's no one with a bit to... to, to you know what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, and so you're going to check it out. And you get there. And I want, I want you to get this. When God gets your attention, pay attention. Amen. Amen? Amen. When God gets your attention, when God does something like this, you don't go, hey, that's nice. You go, wow. Mm -hmm. and, and when he walks over there, I promise you, God got his attention. So, so today, and I, I'm thinking, you know, one of the things God has called us to do is to be emissaries of the gospel, to tell the good news, to touch people's lives with God's grace and his healing mercy. He's yeah. there for us to do that. But he wants to use us to be the emissaries. And Moses is a little, mm, a little reluctant on that. So verse 5 says this. Verse 5 says, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. For the place that you're standing on is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He wanted to qualify, make sure that, that there was no question in Moses' mind that he's dealing with. Now think about this. Moses knew he was called out. Moses knew he was special because God had saved his life from being dead mm -hmm. as a small child. Mm -hmm. He knew that his, there was something special about his mission. His mom ingrained that in him. I'm sure she did. God saved you because you could do something and he put you in Pharaoh's house so maybe you can help get favor for us, the Jews. I don't know what she said, but Moses knew or he wouldn't have killed the soldier way back then. And he also knew all those 40 years in the wilderness, he had miserably failed God. He had miserably messed up. How do you fix that? How do you fix it when you mess up so bad? Well, God came to him. Don't you like that? Moses understood who was speaking to him. And, and the Bible says he hid his face because why? Because he was afraid to look at God. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Woe is me. And God's, the Bible says God then brought an, a, a seraphim down to take a coal from the altar and touch his lips and say, your sins are forgiven. I, I want you to get this all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. God has always provided a way of salvation and forgiveness of sin if we would listen. Amen. Amen. So the Bible said he hid his face. And the Lord says to Moses, I've seen the misery of the people in Egypt. I've heard them crying. Now remember, if you remember the story, you've got to go back to Joseph. God saved the nation from dying of famine. Joseph, who was a favorite son, got thrown and sold to the, as a slave and ends up Pharaoh's right-hand man in Egypt and saves the Jews and they're living there and they're growing there and they're prospering there and Pharaoh, the Pharaoh of that day liked him. But Joseph died and they lost favor and they became slaves. Isn't that sad? 
I want to tell you something. It was, it was a gradual process. Sin is a gradual process. And they went from freedom to enslavement. Satan grabs people out and they have a life of innocency and they're brought into sin. And it gets its hooks in them. And they were enslaved and there's no way to get free. And then Jesus came for us. I like that. I've seen the misery. I, I, I've watched them cry out. And Lord, I, I am the Lord. I am the one who created it all. I'm here for you. And I have chosen you, Moses, to go rescue my people. <laughs> um, I, I think, here, here's Moses' reaction. God says, I have come down to rescue them. Moses is going, yes! Oh, this is great. Thank you, God. <laughs> no, no, really? You know? Thank you. You've come to rescue me. This is great, man. This is glorious. Go to work, God. Go after them. Man, they're being, they're being mean. <laughs> Fix them. <laughs> I've come down to rescue them. I mean, he was excited. I think he was, just, oh, yes. Oh, man, I've been waiting for this all my life. 40 years out here walking around these dumb sheep, and now we're finally going to get to see something good happen out of this story. He'd seen the beatings. He'd seen the way the people had been misused and mistreated. And, 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 and the tragedy was that Moses had taken justice in his own hands, and he's on the lamb. And, 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 folks, I want to tell you something. Sometimes we do the same thing. I had a boss that used to say, I don't get mad, I get even justice in our own hands. Sometimes we tend not to have enough patience to let God do his job. Have you ever thought about that? Maybe the Lord, if the Lord, you know, we say, Lord, I really need some help. And the Lord says, in a minute. And then you read the passage that says that a, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. That's going to be a while. We're impatient folks. Um, we come from, some of you who way back remember in the 60s, we had a thing called, do they still have Tang? Y'all know? We had Tang. It was pretend orange juice. It was this orange Crisco, crystal gruber that they sent with the, with the space guys, and, and, and you would spoon that into your water and stir it, and you had orange juice. No, you didn't. I remember that. There's nothing like fresh squeezed orange juice from Florida. Amen. Right. I, I haven't seen many oranges advertised from Florida. Do you remember that? There used to be always commercials on TV, you know, about squeezed orange juice from Florida. You don't hear much. Maybe maybe they've all frozen out or something. I don't know. But I, but I thought, you know, uh, we don't want to go through the work of peeling that orange and taking each one of those pieces and, and, and squeezing them and crushing them until all the juice comes out to drink it. And then how many oranges do you have to do? So we go to the store and buy some. And we're with that with God too. God, right now, we want right now, right now. And we snap our fingers. And if our snap, if our snappers work, mine isn't working today. It, we snap our fingers. Come on, God, right now. You know, <laughs> please, hurry, hurry, God. And, 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 and what took, I want you to get this. When a person has sinned for 50 years, it's hard to change direction unless God makes an intervention. All right? And so, so Moses is going, sick of God, you go, you got this, thank you, this is great, yay, God. Maybe not, I don't know. I was reminded of a man named Jonah. Remember Jonah? Remember his story? Jonah's been bopping around, minding his own business. God comes to Jonah and says, Jonah, what? I'm, I'm making the, the conversation because I wasn't there. Jonah, what? Hey, Jonah, I've got a job for you. Okay, I'm on. No, no, I want you to go to Nineveh. Nineveh? Nineveh was the worst place in the whole world. They were evil people. They deserved to have God's fire fall from heaven and consume all of them. He said, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach to them. Are you out of your mind? Now, he didn't sing out loud to God. But the Bible says what Jonah did was when God called him, Jonah took a vacation. Remember the story? Took a vacation. Gets on a boat. Goes down below somewhere into one of the cabins, if they had cabins, and goes to sleep. I, I want you to get this. 
in the call, God did not say to Jonah, I have heard the people crying and I've come down to rescue them and I want you to go. God just said, Jonah, I want you to go to those people and preach to them. I don't want to. You ever had a kid say that to you? Here's what I want you to do. You got dishes to do, get them done. I don't want to. I didn't get them all dirty. How about making your bed? Not my job. That's my mom's job. I could go through the whole list. I, we have enough kids. I, I have heard all of the mm -hmm. excuses. Jonah didn't say anything. When God said, Jonah, you go, Jonah said, oh, no, I'm not going to do it. He didn't say it out loud to God. He didn't say, no, God, I'm not. But he said, you know, I, I have four weeks vacation. I'm, I'm taking a break. And the Bible says we find him on a boat, and he's in this boat, and everybody on the boat's pagans. Isn't that great? No one knows anything about his God. But suddenly a storm comes, a, a crazy storm. And, and they're all minding their own business, and this storm comes, and they take the sails down, and they're trying to row and trying to keep the boat from sinking, but it's going to sink, and they start throwing everything they can throw overboard. All the, all the, uh, I wonder who paid them back for all the stuff they threw overboard. Hey, Jonah, you got a bill sitting here waiting for you from all the stuff. Because they had all this cargo. They threw it all overboard, and the boat's still going to sink. One of the guys says, hey, wait a minute. Wasn't there another guy here, that, that, uh, that foreigner guy? I wonder where he's at. So they start looking for him. There he is. He's in the cabin, fast asleep. Get up, man. We're going to sink. And they get him up there, and, and, and they try to decide whose fault it is, and they draw straws, and he gets the straw. Isn't that a great story? Wow. wow. All right. What have you done? Well, the God who created the universe... And everything therein asked me to go to Nineveh, but I really, I really would rather not do that. <laughs> and so I'm on a little vacation. And, 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 and the storm did not dissipate with the confession. You understand this? It got worse. And finally they said, what, 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 what should we do? And he said, throw me overboard. And then it'll calm down. Do you think they wanted to do that? Finally, in desperation, they threw him overboard. I want to tell you something. The, the ship got converted. Do you understand that? Those people got converted. And Jonah hits the water. Why does that so bad? Doing a backstroke. Hey, talk to me in my bag. So he's doing a backstroke, minding his own business, when suddenly a dark shadow comes over him, and the Bible said God prepared a fish to swallow him. We always say it was a whale, but the Bible says a fish. Mm. And for three days and three nights, he stayed in the belly of the whale. And God convinced him without saying a word. Wow. First of all, my question was, how did he get oxygen down there? And I, I can't imagine what was in there, but I could name some stuff. Yeah. But it wasn't anything I want to be in. I just tell you. Amen. <laughs> And somewhere along the third day, Jonah's going, okay, God, I'm still alive. If, if you can save me, please, please help me. So the, the Bible says, I'm going to have to say it in, in the right word. It, the fish went and barfed him up on the beach. That was the BB thing, see. Mm -hmm. And I've always wondered, did Jonah take a shower before he went over to Nineveh? I don't know. But all I know is we find him in Nineveh preaching and did what God asked him to do. Amen. And by the way, a great revival happened. Yes. Woo. I like that, don't you? Amen. I have come to rescue you. I've come down to rescue you. I will lead you out of slavery. I will lead you out of bondage. I will lead you out of debt. I'll lead you, and I'll get you in all these this situations you've got. I'll get you out of all of this stuff if you'll follow me. I'll introduce you to my grace. And by the way, you have to go. Because <laughs> we're going, come on, Lord. Go ahead and do it. Come on. Come down. This place is a mess. It's about time you get involved. And then he says, but I called you. Well, that's different. <laughs> I, I don't know what Moses felt, but I think he was pretty excited at the idea uh, that, that God would call, would, would hear the cries of the people. I think he thought it was pretty awesome that God would do something about it. But, but here's what. When Moses hears this, Moses should have said, okay, 
Whatever you say, Lord, I'm willing to do. But I, I didn't hear that coming from him. Now, I've got, I've got a couple of theories on this, but, but we find, I mean, I think Moses is disappointed a little bit. But wait, you said you were coming down. And you're going to do this. And God says, yeah, but I'm going to use you. I called you to do this. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. If you're going to rescue him and you're coming down, what's this you go business? You, me, you go? You said you were coming down. Evie Hill preached the message, you are God's answer. And, and it was on Moses. Moses was, was, was God. I want you to get this. Moses, Moses was God coming down. Did you get that? Do you understand that when God calls you, it's you, God coming down through you, God touching lives through you, God reaching out through you? We, we don't think about that part of the story. Oh, man, look at me, God. I can't do anything. Yes, you can. See, God isn't looking for the extraordinary. God's looking for an ordinary man or an ordinary woman to do extraordinary things through his power, not because you're capable, but because he will use you if you're willing to be used by him. I like that, don't you? You're God, God's answer to the problem. Lord Jesus. I need to hear that, didn't you? Amen. <laughs> you see, the dilemma in your family, the dilemma with your friends, with your loved ones, it's not something that someone else should do. It's something we should do. And we're so afraid that we're going to offend somebody or make them angry at us. The bottom line is if they spend eternity in hell, they're going to be mad at us even more. Right. You knew. You didn't tell me. Why didn't you tell me? And, and I want you to get this. It's not up to some great speech maker or some great politician or some great influencing leader. There's all these leaders out there that want to teach you how to do all this stuff. They're not the ones, folks. We are God's answer to the world's problems. Wow. Amen. We need to go and do it. It's easier. By the way, see, isn't it easy to say, hey, we just, why don't you guys just go and get it done? And we stand there and we want to supervise. <laughs> I, I've always thought, and I've got several different theories on Moses because I love him. I really do. I think in one side of me, I see when he says, uh, who am I that I should go before Pharaoh? On one side of me, I see this very humble person who's been broken by 40 years in the desert and, and all the boldness and brassness he had is gone from him. And he says, who am I? Man, I, man Lord. But the other side of me says, wait a minute. Here's a guy who God said, I am come down to deliver the people. And he says, well, then who am I? That's something to ponder, isn't it? Yeah. I've got this idea that he was, and I believe he did do great things, and that he was, he was a great and powerful man that God chose, but he, for a while there, faltered greatly. That's how come it got the wimpy prophet part. God says, Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. I want you to bring my people out of Egypt. So I want you to... If you if you got notes in your bulletin, here's one that you ought to write down. When God tries to get your attention, pay attention. Amen. You are God's answer. Mm. You can look at somebody and say, I'm God. Bottom line is, when you look in the mirror today, go home and just say, I am God's answer. Look in the mirror. Amen. Smile at yourself and do your little pose. <laughs> no, you've all done it. You know you have. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you not ever... You know, I remember the fawns. I used to do this before the fawns. You comb your hair and you go, whoa. <laughs> the thumbs up thing. I did that long ago. He did. And I never got credit for that. But I did that. There's a <laughs> all the stories I can tell you. Anyway. But, uh, so, so get this. You're God's, you're God's answer. Mm -hmm. Then when God tips his finger to you, he says, you go for it and I'll be with you. Did You, you heard the promise, right? Mm -hmm. See, when, when God wants us to do it, if he wants you to make restitution, you know what that is, right? Mm -hmm. Making it right. Mm -hmm. When he wants you to make restitution, he will go with you, and you doing that will change someone's life forever. Amen. Mm -hmm. I want you to apologize to someone. And by the way, you apologize whether or not it's your fault. My Lord. Would you forgive me whether or not you did something to be forgiven? Because you're doing something that, that is the act of contrition and will help that person who is the aggressor. And by the way, if they, if they turn their back on you, you've done your part. Amen? Amen. And when God says, I want you to be my witnesses, you do it. Not because you're good at it. 
we, we used to have these evangelism training classes, and the bottom line is that, that it worked really great with the exception of you got to do it, and you got to be not afraid of making a mistake or two because you're still making the effort to go and do. Amen? Amen. So our answer to the Lord is the same thing that Moses should have said, Lord, wherever you send me, I'm ready to go. Um, well, except I don't want to go to Pharaoh. Now, if you... If you now, we're not going to go, I mean, here's what Moses could have done. Hey, I'm the super Bible guy. People are going to read about me for years. I'm going to be in the Old Testament story. <laughs> hey, my name will be, when I'm dead, the, the chapter's going to close. The curtain's coming down. The box, if I'm in a box, we'll, we'll have the lid closed down. It'll be put in the dirt, and I'll be gone. And, and my social security will disappear by a computer click. And my insurance will quit by a computer click. And my cars will transfer to my children or somebody else who gets it. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. When we die, it's over. Now, I don't know if we know we're dead, but the world forgets us really fast. Now, does our family? Hopefully not. But in such a busy world, I, I, there are times we sit alone, we grieve. I still grieve for my dad and my mom. Mm -hmm. Richard Lane, uh, his wife, Jesse Lane, was a member of our church for years. Richard died on the 17th of March, the day that we moved here. Not, he didn't die then, but later on. And, and so I remember his death uh, better than I remember my dad's because this is when I came here. Uh, good man. By the way, he found Jesus. And he was one of those, but when we talk about witnessing to people, towards his life, we never heard him ever say he was a Christian, ever. He didn't go to church. Once in a while he'd come with Jesse, but for the most part, no. But towards the end of his life, he, he wanted a Bible. Towards the end of his life, he watched Billy Graham all the time. Wow. And Jesse said he was such a private person, he would never have said out loud, I know Jesus. And so I want to encourage you, our job is not to get them to witness to us and say, hey, I got it. Our job is to be witnesses to them and give them the opportunity to make the decision to follow or not. Amen. Amen. That's what our job is. And, and so Moses' answer, and, 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 and the sad part is this. Moses, God, says, God says, I've called you, and I want you to go to, a, a, a go to Egypt and bring my people out. And Moses goes, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Why would he say that? Well, I've, I've given you a couple reasons. One, because I'm inadequate. I failed bad. I messed up. How can I unmess this thing? And maybe they're still worn out for my arrest for me. Could be. Could be that he was so overwhelmed with the idea that God would choose him. That as he thought about all those people whose lives would be put in his hands, he was grieved and with humility he said, who am I? The bottom line is, we catch a different Moses here than the brassy guy who killed the, the soldier, the Egyptian soldier years before. The translation is, God, I'm a nobody and you're great. I'm just a little guy who, who's on a run, but you're God. Don't, don't you think you ought to handle this one? I mean, wouldn't you do a better job with Pharaoh than me? That was the first excuse. And, and by the way, we, we've all used it. We all have used this before. I'm nobody. I have nothing to offer. What can I do? Look, we've got a preacher up there. He does it. Or the Sunday school teachers do it, but I'm just me. I can't do much. We've done that, you know. I'm nobody. I have nothing to offer. And then, you know what God says? Write this down. We say to God, I'm a nobody. I don't have anything to offer. You know what God says? I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but let me show you what we can do together. I just said it. I'm going to say it again. God's not looking for extraordinary people. God's looking for ordinary people who would trust in an extraordinary God. You're trusting in the extraordinary God. You're trusting in a God who said, I am is with you. Right. I am is here. Yes. You don't need to have any more of an introduction. I'm here and I will be with you. And Jesus said, I'll be with you till the end of the age. 
and into the end of the end of the end of the age, whatever the age is, I'll be with you all that time. And I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And if you take my yoke upon you, I'm going to teach you some things. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. See, as we read through these passages, we, we sometimes get messed up a little bit, I think, don't we? Uh, our journey is a journey of faith. You know that. And, and I thought, you know, here's something really important to keep in mind. If I'm a nobody and have nothing to offer, I, I want you not to forget this because God used extra, extra, regular, extra, feeble people <laughs> to do some great things. So in ha chapter 11 of Hebrews, listen to what the Bible said. First of all, faith, because that's key to this story today, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, for it's by, the, by it the elders obtained a good testimony. You want to have a good testimony, you live a life of following Jesus by faith. Amen. Amen. Faith that pleases God. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith Enoch was taken away, so he did not see death. By the way, the book of Revelation says he'll be back. Amen. Something upon it. Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently serve him. Serve him. Seek him. By faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Moved with godly fear and prepared an ark. Don't you like that? By faith Abraham obeyed the Lord. When he was called to go out into the place which he would receive an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise as a foreign country. Dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob as heirs with him of the same promise. By faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age, because she judged him, God, faithful who had promised. Don't you like this story? These all, I want you to get this, verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises. Did you get it? But having seen them from afar, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. But those who say such thing declare plainly, and they seek a homeland. By faith Abraham, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of his sons. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure. By faith, Moses, when he was born and hidden three months. By faith, he became a great leader. He became of age and refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By faith, he forsook Egypt. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. And what more shall I say? And then he goes on and names off more. David and Samuel and, and Jephthah and Barak and Samson. And, and he, he names all those who were stoned and torn apart, and they wandered about in sheepskin and, 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 and didn't have it, but they made it. Why? Because God called them, and they were faithful. And that's all God called Moses to do was to be faithful. Don't you like that? Yeah. By faith. Sometimes we're surprised at how the... Ordinary people became so extraordinary. When you read down through the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, we find ordinary people who failed miserably. David with Bathsheba, Samson with Delilah, mm -hmm. failed miserably, and yet God used them to make a, a difference in that day of the world. God called us to be that kind of a person. Amen. Amen. And, and no matter what, no matter what's going on, when God comes to you and touches your heart with something that you can make a difference in the world, and whether it's teaching or leading a group or running an office or starting a ministry or ministering to poor people, whatever your call is, understand this. The word is, I will go with you. Amen. I'll go with you. I'll be with you. And we forget that, folks. Mm -hmm. We get to feeling sorry because we're alone. Oh, and, and, and many times we feel alone. But God is there in spite of all that's going on. I will not leave you. Maybe the Lord wants you to go next door. The dresser in your bedroom went beginning to burn. That was the one that cracked me up because, you know, most of you, you would be calling 911. Ah, there's a fire in my bedroom. You didn't even wait to see if the dresser was going to get burned or not, if there was smoke. God's speaking to you out of the dresser. The drawer opens. Hello, this is the Lord. 
I want you to go next door and share my son with them, and don't worry, I'll go with you. First of all, if your dresser caught fire, most of you would not have waited to find out if God was going to speak to you or not. Right? Is that true? You know, it's true. We would have head on out, head on out, or I would have got the fire extinguisher. I was taught to put fires out. Now, I would have blown fire extinguisher dust everywhere, and the fire would have still been burning. And then the Lord would have said, uh, pay attention. Don't worry. I like this. I'll go with you. And then, and then Moses said, well, well, Lord, I can't go. I, I, look at me. Who am I? He gave another excuse because he gave several excuses. You know what he said? What shall I say? I guess somewhere along the way, Moses started stuttering. <laughs> he did. Couldn't talk. Well, what shall I say? What shall I do? The president of service, you've heard of service master, right? That company. The president of service master said this, anything worth doing is worth doing wrong the first time. How many of you have ever started a task that, anyone ever crochet? Hey, did y'all get it the first day you did it? You got a ball of yarn and thought, oh, this is going to be great. I'm going to make me a, uh, I'm going to make me a great big Afghan. And you got about the size of a little uh, hot pad and you said, uh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> you got to stick. If you're going to get good, you got to make a few mistakes. I'll bet there are a lot of people who do the crocheting have had to undo a whole lot because they messed up somewhere along the way. In order to make it right, you don't just finish it with that bad stitch. You go back and take it all apart till you get back to that spot and then you redo it. Right? <laughs> God says, if you make a little mistake, I'll be with you anyway. I'll help you get through this. So write it down. Anything worth doing is worth doing wrong the first time. Get going. By the way, you know what God said to Moses? I'll tell you what you need to say. You know what Moses said? I can't say it. I don't know how to do it. So Moses, Moses gave five excuses. And they're the same excuses we have. We use, we use these excuses. Here's one. I know I'm a nobody. God says, I'll go with you. We say, I don't know what to say. You know what God says? I'll tell you what to say. We say, what if they don't believe me? Listen to me. This is real important. This is the most important one probably. What if they don't believe me? It's not your job for them to believe you. Did you get that? It's not your job. Your job is to tell the truth. Your job is to say what God has asked you to say. Your job is not to make them believe what you have to say. You just tell them the story and you move on. Yeah. And then we say to God, look at me. Look at me. How could you want me? You know what God says? Yeah, I know. I made you. <laughs> so, so Moses doesn't quit here. He doesn't quit. Send somebody else. Send somebody else. And you know what God says? No, not someone else. Why? Because you're God's answer. You're God's answer to a dying world. You're God's answer to taking the story out. You're God's answer to making sure there are people that you know will get to heaven because you walk their way. You're the answer to God's commission. You're the answer to your neighbor next door. You're the answer to the drunk down the street or, or, or those children who need to know Jesus. You're God's answer to friends at school if you're in school. You're God's answer to the family at home. You can make a difference in your families at home if you do what God asks you to do. I'm about done. So my question today is, what did God lay on your heart? What are you going to do about the story? Moses was pretty shook up. The first part I, I thought a little humorous because he, he saw the fire and all this. But, but what I, I find out of this story is Moses is, is perplexed with how am I going to do this? And, and all these things came to him. And the first thing, and all of us are guilty of this. All of us have said, God, I'm a nobody. How can you ask me to do that? And most of us have said, I don't know what to say. And, you know, it's kind of like I can tell a lot of great jokes. But if I had to get online and do it. Or get up in front of a crowd and tell all those jokes, I'd be blank. What am I going to say? God say, I'll wake your brain up. 
what if they don't believe me? It's not your job whether or not they believe you. Your job is to tell the story. When Jonah went out to tell the story, he went out to preach knowing that they would not believe him. He did, and they changed. And they got his ashes and sackcloth and repented of themselves. And guess what? I mean, he was kind of irritated because they deserved to die. Our job is not to be judge. Our job is not to do the other things. Our job is to follow Jesus and say, Lord, I'll present it if you'll help me do it. Amen? Amen. And we've all said, send somebody else. Haven't we? So today, I want you to stand. I'm going to wrap this up. What has God laid on your heart? What difference can you make in, in your part of the world? And whether we're in America or other countries, or, or in big cities or small cities, who do you know that needs the story? And God just said this morning, I have chose you. And we're going, but wait, 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 wait. I don't know if I can do this or not, Lord. I don't know if I can do it. And we say, but, but, but God, and we make these excuses, Lord, help me. Help me, Lord, to follow what you want. Help me make a difference in a broken world. Help me make a difference in my family who are lost. By the way, all of us have family members who are never going to find Jesus with the exception of how we reflected Jesus in our life. Amen? So we're going to pray. And we're just going to ask the Lord simply to take us in our brokenness, in our humanness, in our realness, and say, Lord, use me. If you will, use me. Help me to make a difference. My hope is when we get to heaven as our congregation, we get to heaven, we're going to have masses come up and say, hey, because you said this, because you lived this way, I followed you, and you followed Christ. Paul used to say that, follow me as I follow Christ. Father, we bow before you today. We've had a great worship time. Just praising you. And then we got to this passage of our good friend Moses. And Lord, we didn't kill anybody. We've done some pretty dumb stuff down through the years. And some have wandered for many years in the wilderness. And you came to us with a burning bush and said, I chose you to do something. And we get afraid. Lord, would you help us to overcome our fear? Would you help us to make a difference? Would you help us to make the opportunity to, to, to let others find you a reality in our lives? And Father, the burden is on us sometimes. And we overthink everything that you ask us to do. Help us to make it simple. Help us just to do what you said. Help us not to worry about whether they believe or not. Help us just to do what you ask us to do. Give us those words, Lord. Open our mouths. Open our hearts and our minds. You said you'd do that. And then, Father, forgive us for making excuses. We're so good at that. We, uh, Try to excuse the things we can't do. And this morning we would ask nothing more than this, that you would help us to take the step of faith, to trust you, and to believe that you've got this under control. For this we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now the next time you see a burning bush or something spectacular, Stop and take a look. Listen for the call of the Lord. May God bless you. May he fill you. May he use you to turn this world upside down. Go with God. I love you. 10 o'clock next Sunday morning. We'll see you here and online. We'll be looking for you. God bless you. Amen. Bye-bye.